I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event, the BU Center for the Humanities, the Center for the Study of Europe, the Translation Seminar, the Interdisciplinary Program in Italian Studies, and CGS. V.S. Naipaul wrote that nonfiction can distort, facts can be realigned, but fiction never lies. When we read fiction, we can't help but read between the lines, hoping to catch a glimpse of the inner life, not just of characters, but also of the author. Fiction never lies. We want to find this space of vulnerability, perhaps, because, however unconsciously, we seek a kind of companionship. We want to make sure we're not as utterly alone as we suspect we are. But as Naipaul suggests, nonfiction is another creature, one that poses as truth, but more often than not, conceals what fiction cannot help but expose. Nonfiction often presents a more formal version of the writer. I think of Janet Malcolm's cool assessments of murderers, criminals, and poets. It would make an interesting study to look at Tim Park's various forays into fiction and nonfiction, the compendium of selves he presents. I often conflate the two genres in his work. When I first read the novel Cleaver, I felt as if I were getting close to the mind of an obsessive a highly accomplished and vigorous egomaniac, albeit a transfixing one. Teach Us to Sit Still, his memoir, offered yet another version of Parks, the skeptic turned believer. Painting Death, his most recent novel, throws up another guise, that of Morris Duckworth, a murderous art lover. And in the nonfiction Italian ways, we imagine Parks as a quiet but observant traveler on the Italian commuter rail. Last night at the Editorial Institute here at BU, um, which is one of the most magnificent spots on campus um, <laughs> for great thinking, to find great thinking, uh, Parks gave a spellbinding reading of a work in progress in which he imagines firsthand encounters with James Joyce, Thomas Hardy, Charles Dickens, and D.H. Lawrence. Parks is a fearless writer. He marches us right into the intimate lives of these figures in what Parks might call a theater of meetings. Masks are removed. We become witness to their foibles, their peculiar tics of behavior, their long-lived habits such as borrowing money from friends, scowling at their wives. All the while, we think we're learning just as much about Parks' interests, and hence Parks himself, as we are learning about the authors under discussion. Parks believes in what surfaces can reveal about characters, rather than let a shaft down into the real life of the protagonist, he lets us see him or her as others see him or her, and reveals to us how poorly we can actually disguise our true selves, which forever slip out in unseemly ways. How lucky for us tonight, then, that we get to sit back while Parks spins another tale or two. I can't wait to see where he's going to take us. <clears throat> Well, I hope there'll be nothing unseemly this evening, that's all. <laughs> nothing slipping out. <laughs> I'm safely behind the podium anyway. So, um, no, this evening we're going to talk about Italy. Um, is this okay? Is this microphone too loud? No? That's no, okay. Um, very little about parks this evening. Very little about selves. Um, what I'm going to do, try to do, is to talk about the Italian national character uh, as a sort of existential condition um, and to try and understand this place that I've lived in now for 33, 34 years. And we're going to try and understand him mainly through the figure of one of my, uh, one of the most important influences really on my writing, uh, an Italian poet 
in the 19th century, uh, Giacomo Leopardi. So, Italians are endlessly criticizing and despising each other, yet always react badly to foreign criticism. That, of course, is not my own observation. That is Giacomo Leopardi talking to us in something he wrote in 1824, a discourse on the present state of the customs of the Italians. It's a broad generalization, but I think it's, it generally holds. If, for example, if Tim Parks, as a resident foreigner in Italy, were to write some article that says that Italy has a shamefully high level of youth unemployment at 45%, or that it's lost 30% of its manufacturing, or that its politicians uh, 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 are almost all under investigation, or at least a good half of them in Parliament. Um, if I point out that the Prime Minister himself is not an elected member of Parliament, but the Mayor, and that the leader of the main opposition party uh, has just completed a four-year sentence for corruption and fraud. Actually, his four-year sentence for corruption and fraud amounted to about 20 visits to an old people's home. That was how he served four years uh, of prison, theoretically. If I add that, in general elections, votes are freely bought in southern towns for prices that range from about three to 10 euros, um, or again, uh, that employment opportunities depend very largely uh, on family relationships. If I say any of this, or even half of it, I will be shredded in the Italian press. And in fact, the last time I did write something that was, that was published in the States about Italy, Corriere della Sera actually dedicated a front page editorial to rebutting and rebuking me, which was of course a huge honor. <laughs> and yet all these things are actually part of the daily conversation in Italy. They raise no eyebrows. Uh, no eyebrows at all. And yet the foreigner mustn't say these things. If, on the other hand, the foreigner were to praise Italy, as we all do, recognizing its beauty, its cultural heritage, its wonderful landscape, its extraordinary cu cuisine, its hospitality, uh, the flair of its designers, its fashions, and so on and so forth, all these compliments will be accepted in silence as the kind of things that foreigners do say in the dark as they are and must be about the country's real nature. So it's a curious mindset. Um, perhaps my relationship with Verona might, might help you uh, to get a sense of, of, of the uh, almost schizophrenia behind this. In 2002, after I made some remarks about an Italian football team, about one of the two football teams in Verona. The mayor of Verona, Michele Cironi, at the time, who was also a member of the European Parliament, that's quite common in Italy for people to have three or four things going on. Um, she said in the local paper that guests to the town should keep quiet and should not make offensive comments. Uh, guests. I had been living in the country, and in Verona in particular, for 21 years at that point in time, paying all my taxes. But guest is an interesting concept that you should keep your, mind, uh, your eye on. A guest is welcome, and he deserves treatment, special treatment, but he doesn't belong. A guest doesn't belong. In 2008, I received an email from the Daily Mail. Um, they wanted me to write an article on Verona. They asked me to describe Verona as the capital of kitsch, as a phony Romeo and Juliet Disneyland. The reason why they wanted me to do this was that Sarkozy, president at the time, was planning to visit Verona, it seemed, for his honeymoon with the wonderful uh, Carla Bruni. And they wanted to hit Sarkozy by saying, that he was going to a Disneyland town for his marriage. Can you imagine? Um, I refused, obviously. I wrote back and said Verona was a wonderful place and that Sarkozy was making the right decision to come and visit us. Some days later, I got a call from the local newspaper saying, Parks, can you comment on this ferocious article that has been written in the Daily Mail by a certain Tobias Jones 
describing Verona as a Keats and Foley, Romeo and Juliet Disneyland, those very words. It was published by the Daily Mail, obviously. I said I hadn't read the piece, and I was very busy at the time, but I said I would happily show them my email exchange with the Daily Mail so that they could understand where that article was coming from. Two days later, I received an invitation from the mayor's office to become an honorary citizen of Verona. <laughs> Extraordinary. I had already written three books on the country, um, and there had been no mention uh, of me anywhere. At the, at, the, um, at, at, at the ceremony where I received honorary citizenship, but honor doesn't seem to collocate very well with, with me. I don't know why, it just feels wrong. But anyway, at that particular occasion, the mayor spoke of my admirable, admirable renunciation of personal interest and even money. <laughs> I had renounced even money for the love of the city. Okay. Now, of course, these remarks are all anecdotal, but I hope to tie them in with some comments uh, from Leopardi's vision of why Italian national character is actually something that people of every nation should keep an eye on, mm -hmm. a sort of future negative state of human, uh, of human social development. <laughs> as, we talk, as we talk about this, no, that was really Leopardi's position, that, that, that Italy is, in a certain way, ahead in its march towards <laughs> nihilism. <laughs> That was his position. He's not, and I don't think it's entirely. Perhaps I'm trying to make this sound too funny. It's a sign of anxiety on my part, I can assure you. Let's also keep an eye on this whole question of a sense of belonging uh, as we talk about this. The whole, the pleasure of being an initiate with other initiates, but also in a place where other people are not initiates, and so you feel uh, a distinct as it were, separation from them and superiority from them. Let's quickly dispel, as we start, that possible objection that's so often raised when you talk about Italy, that Italy doesn't exactly exist as a nation. I mean, we all, we all know the famous remark made by Metternich, um, the Austrian chancellor, in 1847, or foreign minister, I'm not sure if chancellor is the right word there, actually. He said, the word Italy is a geographical expression, a description which is a useful shorthand but has none of the political significance that the efforts of revolutionary ideologues are trying to put on it and which is full of dangers for the very existence of the states which make up the peninsula. That was in 1847. Um, that was actually 10 years after, after Leopardi died. At that time, Italy was made up of about a dozen states uh, and about half of those were being run by Austria, so it was rather in Metternich's interest to say that. <clears throat> there are still people in Italy today who believe that the dozen or so Italian states of the time should have remained separate. The idea is as strong in the north as in the south. And in a recent book, actually, uh, uh, historian David Gilmore, in a book, The Pursuit of Italy, recently fielded this idea that Italy was much better when it was divided up um, and that it's actually been Italian unity which has caused the country's downfall. I'm not sure if there, there really has been a complete downfall, but anyway, that is the position that Gilmore takes. And basically, <clears throat> a lot of Italians also take this. They blame, blame any difficulty on unity, um, which is, of course, to say they blame it on a different part of the country. Major Italian writers of all times have disagreed. Here's Machiavelli at the end of The Prince in 1514. So now Italy lies half dead, waiting to see who will heal her wounds and put an end to the devastation of Lombardy, the extortionate taxation of Tuscany and Naples, who will clean up the sores that have festered too long. You can see the countries praying God to send someone to save her, from the cruelty and barbarity of these foreigners. You can see she is ready and willing to march beneath a flag if only someone were to raise one up. 
He was talking, of course, about all the foreign invasions that had taken place in Italy in the early 16th century. You can see that it's a rhetoric of nationalism and that Ma Machiavelli accepts entirely that Italy exists. Uh, Leopardi the same. And in fact, Leopardi, uh, in distinguishing who is allowed to criticize Italy and who isn't, tacitly accepts that the country exists as a whole. He says, the Italians are extremely delicate when it comes to criticism, which is really strange when you consider the very little love we show for our nation, or none at all, certainly less than what you find in other countries. And the reason for this is no doubt that judging other nations by their own standards, Italians inevitably attribute every word written about them that is less than positive to the foreigners' hatred, ill will, and envy. Anybody who says something less than positive can only be expressing envy. But being Italian himself, Leopardi feels he can't be criticized in the same way. He can write freely about my own nation, almost to my own family, my own brothers and sisters. Again, only a sense of belonging can give you a right to criticize other people. Only the idea that they are brothers and sisters. He goes on, if foreigners don't really know how Italians behave, above all between themselves, as, a as, as if there was a different kind of behavior between themselves and between themselves and foreigners, as a result of which it is difficult for an outsider to get a clear idea of our day-to-day -day social manners. This is partly because of the lack of real society in Italy, but also because we are prone to spare foreigners the treatment that we reserve for each other. My whole experience in Italy, especially at the university, has been one of seeking to overcome the idea that as a foreigner, I can't understand what's going on. I might know the rules, but the rules are really something that is there to be, uh, something that is there in order that what is really going on be not seen, I think is the best description of the rules in Italy. Uh, no, no, very frequently at the university, um, any behavior that I take is put down to my not having understood. This is an old idea. Um, if we look at the ruling elite in Florence in the 15th century, we're talking then about the Medici family, or the Medici family, as the Americans like to call them, or the English. Um, they had an expression, there was actually an expression the secret things of our town, it was an expression, the secret things of our town. And they would have debates in their, um, in their little parliament where they would quest, they would, someone would raise the question, is it time to admit such and such a person into the secret things of our town? The answer was very often no. Um, <laughs> So I hope what begins to emerge is a sense that, that there's a very clear perception of, of who belongs and who isn't, that power is always wielded by people on the inside, and that power is always a cult. Okay. That, that if the whole question in Italy is really who is inside and who is outside, then you have to say inside or outside what? The family, the city? a trade association, a region, almost my own family, Leopardi says of the Italians, almost. Cosimo de' Medici actually referred to the Florentines always as his family. Mussolini used to use the same metaphor for his fasce, his little bundles of resilient belonging, and by extension to fascist Italy. Berlusconi speaks uh, frequently of Fininvest, his major company, as a family, and likewise his party, Forza Italia, as a family. Um, so we should also notice that one of the qualities of families is that they remain families even when they disagree intensely. And in fact, with a lot of families, the more intensely the fight they fight, the more we know that they are a family. Um, can be the true of marriages as well. You know two people are married, when they're arguing in a restaurant, basically, so common. 
So you could think of Italy as an extended dysfunctional family. <laughs> and family sucks energies from its members. In a long process of intense infighting, so that in fact, uh, this is the destiny, it seems to me, of so many of Italy's finest, finest minds, to be exhausted in infighting. And in fact, at a political level, it's evident to everyone that Italy, uh, as a large European country, has, has the weakest foreign policy and the weakest international influence of all the major European states. But now let's look at uh, Leopardi's fascin fascinating analysis of how all this comes to be. The guy wrote it when he was 26. He was born in a little town called Recanati in 1798. That's near the Adriatic coast. It was in the Papal States, so we're about the same level as Rome. The Papal States were about the most backward place in Western Europe at this time. Leopardi's father was a small-time aristocrat. He was banned from handling money because of various business failures. Um, can you imagine? His wife handled the money, and he was not allowed to. Uh, the only thing he was allowed to do was to set up a library, which was this kind of hobby. And when Napoleon emptied the various monasteries uh, during his invasion of Italy, uh, Monaldo Leopardi, Leopardi's dad, went and bought uh, all the books from the monasteries. And then he told his eldest son, Giacomo, to get on and read all the books and defend the faith in the future. So here you have a little boy who's brought up to the task of reading all his books in a very remarkable library of thousands upon thousands of books, all religious books in many languages. Leopardi was uh, a prodigy. He was speaking five or speaking, reading five or six languages by age nine or 10, um, all this to impress his father and save the faith. Uh, unfortunately, the books led him to lose his faith, something that can happen with books. <laughs> and the world suddenly, suddenly, and very precociously, he decided at about age 18 that the world was, as he called it, a solid nothing. It was utterly meaningless. So he leapt about 100 years ahead of his contemporaries uh, into the existential absurd. The books also ruined his health. Um, he had become a hunchback by the time he was about 16. Um, <clears throat> desperate to it. Let me just give you a few details, because Leopardi is such a wonderful guy um, to think about in many ways. Leopardi went to Rome finally when he was 20. It was the first time he'd ever left home. He was hoping for a job in a library. <laughs> Can you imagine? He hated it. He, he wrote one of the most remarkable comments on Rome that you're ever likely to hear. All the greatness of Rome has no other purpose than to multiply the distances and numbers of steps you have to climb to see anyone at all. <laughs> Roman conversation is an endless stream of gossip, the dullest and most despair-inducing on earth. Even the women are disappointing. The ugliest and crassest Reconati prostitute is better than all the street work at walkers of Rome. He wasn't in a good mood, obviously, at that time. He set out, more or less at this point, to write, to write uh, a diary, which would come to be called the Zibaldone, which just means a hodgepodge. It's about 4,000 pages long. Um, and, and much of what's written in it anticipates Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. Uh, the, the book was left in a trunk and did not actually get published until some 70 years after he was dead. So, very quickly, let me, let me give you a sense of what he says about, it, about Italy. Basically, he starts off with his own experience that life is a solid nothing, that all shared belief systems and values are over, um, that they have been destroyed by the intellect and by science, that the Enlightenment was pretty much a disaster that there are no illusions left. The word illusion is um, extremely important for Leopardi. It's not a negative word for him. The word illusion is a positive word. It means the thing that gets you through despite the fact that life is meaningless. OK. So illusion is an interesting idea that, that Leopardi fastens on const constantly. 
Um, and basically, he's simply suggesting that given what he called the disaster or the, or the, 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 um, the slaughter of and the massacre of illusions, uh, it is now very difficult to keep society together. There is no point in hiding the fact that with the almost universal extinction or weakening of the beliefs on which moral principles are founded, all those opinions without which it is impossible that just and honest behavior should seem reasonable. Given that situation, the, converse, the conservation of society seems more the work of chance than anything else, to the point that it appears amazing that it can happen at all between individuals who continually hate and undermine each other and try in every possible way to impede each other. That was how uh, Leopardi saw society. And the question he asks is, how have different countries reacted to the loss of belief? He comes to the conclusion that society is only held together where it is held together by the principle of society itself. People attrib attribute value to the praise and respect they get from others. This boosts self-esteem and encourages them to do things that will win more respect. This, too, is an illusion, he says, talking about honor, esteem, because it consists in the esteem that individuals receive from other people's opinions of them, opinions which, strictly speaking, are of no importance. But it is such a low, lethargic, unimpressive illusion that it easily hides its vanity even from eyes practiced at finding the truth. Modest it is, as it is, this illusion is extremely powerful, but only in those nations and classes who boast the kind of close-knit society which alone can foster a principle of honor. So what he's suggesting is that moral behavior is now underpinned by exactly the same principles as shared tastes and fashions. It's just a question of worrying about other people's opinions. The polite classes of England and France are ashamed of behaving badly in the same way as they are ashamed of coming to dinner with a stain on their jacket or a pair of threadbare trousers. They involve themselves in some good work for the same reasons and with no more benevolent impulse and sentiment than the way they consider how to stay in fashion and how to impress with the right clothes accessories, furniture, and so on. If that sounds like criticism, Leopardi was saying, in the modern world, this is the only glue we have. So we must applaud it. And the problem, as he sees it, is that in Italy, there are no polite classes and no established society. <coughs> and this for reasons of the country's division, its lack of a recognized center, the power of the church, um, and so on and so forth. So as a necessary consequence of this, Italians, he says, do not fear seeming different from others. They don't fear the opinion of others in any way. And every Italian city and every Italian individual creates his own code of behavior. As a result, every Italian is more or less equally honored and dishonored. Or rather, since there can be no honor without a shared sense of society, Italians are neither honored nor dishonored. This is actually, this is actually a, a fascinating game to play, is to try and think of an Italian who is entirely honored or dishonored. And it's very difficult. I mean, if you think of people like Mazzini, Garibaldi, uh, Mussolini, Andreotti, Togliatti, Berlusconi, um, the major figures we could say in the last 150 years of Italian history, all of them are admired uh, by some and all of them are loathed by others. Even Garibaldi is loathed, uh, particularly in the area, areas like Verona, by many, and even Mussolini is still revered by some. There are basically no heroes, as the English have people like Nelson or Churchill. Uh, no doubt the Americans, uh, I, I don't want to specify for you who you admire, perhaps Washington, 
Um, they don't have anybody. They don't have any figures like that who are beyond that. Um, let, me try and, let me try and give you a, uh, you will all remember um, that event that happened, when was it? Uh, a couple of years ago when a very, very large um, uh, ocean going liner, it was June, January 13th, 2012, uh, a large ocean-going liner, exactly twice as large as the Titanic, and the largest ocean-going liner ever to have sunk, hit a tiny rock <laughs> outside the tiny island um, of Giglio, um and, and went down amazingly. The captain abandoned ship, uh, as we know, earlier uh, than most of the passengers, 32 people died despite the fact that the ship was in absolutely calm water at a distance of some 100, 200 meters from the shore. The captain, a guy called Francesco uh, Schettini, Schettino, is not yet in jail, although uh, Italian juridical process, we remember, requires uh, usually three trials, uh, a trial and then a and then an appeal, and then a, an appeal at a higher level. And the sentences are not executive until one arrives at the highest level, unless we're talking about something like, like murder. So, well, murder. Uh, meantime, as he was free, the Sapienza University, which is one of the major universities in Rome, invited Schettino to come and speak to their students on the question of panic management. I think that's rather extraordinary. It's a question of panic management. At the small village where he lives, which is in the south of Italy, a place called Meta di Sorrento, he was welcomed home with banners who complained that the national press was destroying him and insulting their village in the process. Uh, a guy called Giuseppe Tito, who was the leader of the local um, Partito Democratico, spoke of Schettino as a hero who had saved 4,200 people. <laughs> you will have guessed that the total complement on the ship was 4,232. Um, and Schettino actually officially backed uh, Tito's candidature, candidature for mayor, which he won. So it is, Leopardi's actually um, right on there when he speaks about no Italians uh, being totally honored or dishonored. Basically, he suggests that Italians then have reached the same level of knowledge, of intellectual awareness of the world, to understand that beliefs are completely empty, but they do not have, as the English and French, he claims, have, that kind of concern about what other people think of them, which might allow them to behave better. He says, uh, the although, although perhaps intellectually the Italians are not uh, through education at the same level as the French or English, when it comes to practicality, the Italians are a thousand times more philosophical than the greatest philosopher of those nations because they have no illusions. They can see no reason for putting off pleasure. They do not admire someone who puts off pleasure because there is no reason to do so. Um, is, is all of this true today? He goes on, Leopardi goes on, on, on to this to say, in reality, given the absence of any close society, having public opinion on your side brings but little advantage, and having it against you causes but little damage, so that however much reason people may have to think well of you or badly of you, or to speak well of or badly of you, they will soon be tired of doing both the one and the other, however proven or considerable those reasons are, and they will go back to speaking and thinking of you with complete indifference. Again, it is extraordinary to think of the survival of a politician like Berlusconi, um, about we know whom we, we know so much about his private life. <laughs> um, and yet the Bunga Bunga Nights are now forgotten. Um, Berlusconi has now completed his four years, uh, supposed four years prison sentence, and is ready to head his party uh, once again. Um, 
Does anybody suggest how, 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 what, what a problem this is for collective mental health in Italy? That is, there is a tendency when you read, um, when you read articles about Italy to imagine that the Italians are entirely happy with the state of affairs in which they find themselves. But this is not the case. Leopardi again is right in this, where he suggests that the English and French have an unwarrantedly high opinion of themselves, something that sustains their mutual self-esteem. It actually has wonderful pages on how come the French manage to think so positively about themselves. But at the same time, he suggests that actually this is mentally a very healthy state of affairs because it means that each of them supports the, the esteem of the others. The English and French, he says, may laugh at someone who is not present, but will respect him to his face. The Italians will laugh at someone who is present and make him feel as bad as possible. <laughs> Raillery and insult make up all the real conversation there is in Italy. It is the only art of conversation the Italians know. What conversation there is in Italy is a school for insult, he goes on. You, well, if you watch political um, talk shows in Italy, it is really quite extraordinary, um, just quite extraordinary that everybody's constantly interrupting and insulting each other. Um, there, there, there was a, a well, I, don't, I don't want to go into the details on that. Sooner or later, sooner or later, Leopardi says, because his point is that nobody can stay out of this. Sooner or later, everyone is forced to arm themselves and get involved or risk being oppressed and overwhelmed by others. Not respecting each other, they cannot themselves be respected. And he arrives at this point, at which point I will perhaps finish this, this general in introduction to him and, ma and maybe read one or two things to you. He arrives at this point. One result of this is that not only does life in Italy have no truth or substance, which is actually the case everywhere, but it doesn't even have the appearance of truth or substance. That is, you cannot in Italy even fool yourself that life might be serious. Um, how could I, how could I? Let me try and let me try and express. When you go to Italy at the, the beginning, um, you get terribly interested in reading the political scandals in the newspapers, and you think, "Oh, they have denounced and Andreotti is a member of the mafia. Now something very major is going to happen," uh, and it doesn't happen. <laughs> it does nothing happens, and the guy goes on. And you read in the American press that Berlusconi is finished because he's been condemned. And in fact, you know perfectly well that Berlusconi isn't finished and that, that nothing has actually happened. You, you, you read of an English politician who, explain, who, ex, who exchanges some slightly risque uh, material on his, on his mobile phone with another woman. Perhaps he shows him a photograph of some unseemly part of his body that, that he shouldn't. And, and he immediately resigns. Uh, the Italian Prime Minister is known to have been in bed with a prostitute um, at particularly crucial moments uh, in, in international politics, exchanging phone calls while the, the lady was actually recording things on her own phone. And, and Italians do not wish to uh, make him pay for this in any way. That is, there is no shame, uh, no shame at all for appearing in public with a stain on your clothes, as it were. Uh, and and Leopardi had it dead right in that regard. One thing that his book does suggest is that the Italians are, as it were, a nation in search of a collective illusion that might help them escape from a state of complete and utter cynicism, which he says is the only proper and natural form of behavior for someone in the condition that Italians are in. And in fact, one can look at Italian history. Um, Leopardi himself tried to get, tried to become uh, engaged in the Risorgimento national movement, uh, movement for, 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 for national unity. Um, he managed to convince himself very briefly and wrote some, some rather turgid poems uh, about his love of his country, 
which he then stopped writing. Um, but one could look at the Risorgimento, the nationalism that followed, um, the fascism, communism, the European community, as all very, very large projects which, as it were, tried to, to create a sense of enthusiasm that might give life uh, the appearance of being serious. Um, but in all of these cases, it has to be said that Italy has been very seriously let down by these various illusions. It's interesting that, that um, Mussolini, who spoke of the Italians as a gesticulating, chatterbox, superficial, carnivalesque people, uh, that's uh, Mussolini in one of his bad moods, uh, he too uses the word illusion as, as Leopardi uses it. He says, it is faith which moves mountains because it gives the illusions that mountains move. Illusion is perhaps the only reality in life. Um, coming from, from Mussolini. So basically, one of the things that, that's happening in Italy now is that as, as the country plunges economically, into a state that, frankly, has left more or less half young people unemployed and everybody I meet in the university um, wondering if they will ever be invited to work in another country. Um, the number of people talking about leaving Italy is, is simply quite extraordinary. Uh, the country seems desperately, indeed, at this very moment, to be looking for the kind of illusion that would allow it uh, to start functioning, and, and yet this illusion <coughs> never occurs, and uh, the world in which we live and move daily uh, continues to be uh, moved forward entirely by matters of personal interest. Uh, I go to my accountant to make my tax declaration, and he says to me, Senior Parks, do you really want to declare all this money? Um. <laughs> Which pretty much says it, says it all. Um, so there's a constant feeling that if I declare this money, I'm being stupid. Um, and even my accountant thinks that I'm being stupid. Um, I will now read a bit to cheer us up from a book called Italian Ways, which is ostensibly a book about Italian railways, but it's really an attempt to, to think about my own 30 years of long-range commuting with Italian railways and to think about the railways in terms of belonging. The railways are one of those big national institutions that exist in Italy. Um, and watching people on the railways, one gets a a pretty rapid sense of where people belong. It's actually perhaps worth remembering that it, Italian Railways was the first major national economic corruption scandal uh, of the unified Italian parliament when it was discovered that um, the railway companies were in fact owned anonymously by very large numbers of parliamentarians who were then financing themselves from... Um, from uh, from the government, yeah. It, it did not cause, uh, I, I don't think anybody went to jail over the matter. Anyway, this is, I'm just gonna read to finish up this and then, then we'll, there'll be a chat with, with you and with Meg. I'm gonna read a passage uh, from Italian Ways. I used to commute between Verona and Milan, which is about an hour and a half to two hours on the train, depending if you took a fast train or a slower train. Uh, I used to teach evening courses in Milan and return in the evening, getting the last, the last train back, or one of the last trains. Um, and I would eat a sandwich, a piadina, on the platform. This is a little passage about Italian, Italian rhetoric. Uh, well, well, Italian rhetoric is famous um, for, for its floweriness and its generosity. Uh, Leopardi makes the point very clearly that uh, in a country which believes in nothing, one has to insist on language to kind of drum it into your head that um, 
that life is indeed serious, as it were. Let me give, let me give you an example. In fact, before I begin that reading, um, I remember the mayor who said he has surrendered self-interest, even money, as if this was something quite inconceivable. Here was a plaque that, a plaque on a wall that I recently saw in a little village called Pizzo in Calabria. It's a plaque dedicated to someone called Benedetto Musolino. So, it's a name, curious name. From a Jacobin family that from 1799 onward spilt its blood for these walls, he was born and died Benedetto Musolino. 8th of February, 1809, 15th of November, 1885. He was among the first to advo advocate the unity of Italy. He was among the first to fight for social reform, the emancipation of the serfs, the emancipation of women, the emancipation of the Jews, the reclamation of the South, universal and perpetual peace, a common constitution for all peoples to defend liberty, equality, and civil progress for all. Like Tommaso Campanella, he was a man of his time, of our time, and of times to come. This stone was laid on 16th November 1985 by the Regional Council of Calabria. Calabria, as we know, of course, is the home of the Indrangheta, one of the most feared criminal organizations of the world. 1985, when this stone was laid, saw the beginning of the Second Indrangheta War, which killed 600 people. Members of the regional council, involved, including members of the Council of Pizzo, the people who put up this plaque, were arrested for their involvement in this war. And in 1983, shortly before this, the town of Limbadi, which is about 20 kilometers from Pizza, the local elections were actually won by a criminal boss in hiding. That is. <laughs> and they put up this plaque. So there is a certain gap between rhetoric and reality in this place. It's interesting, it's interesting also in this that it says, like Tommaso Campanella, he was a man of his time. Tommaso Campanella was a Calabrian, and, and so the Calabrese, and so uh, in a way, they are claiming, again, a sort of local achievement. Let me read you something much less harmful um, about my evening returns from Milan. This is uh, Stazione Centrale, Milano. Often, I take my piedina to one of the stone benches on the platforms and eat to the sound of the station announcements. Many of the trains have such splendid names. Ludovico Sforza, Andrea Doria, such names that it's really a pleasure to listen to them. Leonardo da Vinci, Tiepolo, Giorgione, Michelangelo. These are not the names of the actual physical locomotives, nor of any particular carriage. They are just the name announced when whatever rolling stock is being used for such and such a route at such and such a time approaches the station. The Brenner Express, the Gianduia, it's a name that is, as it were, the event of the train. The station announcements are pre-recorded in segments and then tacked together, presumably by computer, as appropriate. So as a result, the words come out in little mechanical rushes. Di prima e seconda classe. Con servizio di ristorante e minibar. And then a dramatic flourish when one of the big train names is pronounced. Michelangelo! Vivaldi! <laughs> Apparently, it was impossible for whoever recorded this initial pool of information not to read out the names, the glorious names, without intense and understandable pride. The same goes for the names of one or two of the big city stations. For example, at the announcement of Genova Piazza Principe or Venezia Santa Lucia, there is a sudden increase of volume and urgency that cuts through the monotonous flatness of the PA system. So, a typical announcement at Milano Centrale listing the train number, the name, and the details of its time and platform of departure echoes round the huge old building thus. Intercity, 6, 0, 8, 
Ugo Foscolo di prima e seconda classe Teleora 16 e 05 con servizio di ristorante e minibar per Perezia Santa Lucia e in partenza dal binario 14 si ferma a Brescia, Tessinzano, Peschiera, Verona Porta Nuova, San Bonifacio, Vicenza, Padova e Mestre, carrozze di prima classe in settori P e C. It's curious in these announcements how one has to listen to all kinds of information that is absolutely standard for all intercities, first and second class, buffet, minibar, etc., before, before they tell you where the train is going. And people stand on the platform in rapt attention, waiting patiently for the only two pieces of information that matter, the destination and the platform. <laughs> for who has any notion of the code numbers of the trains or even their names? And since no one pays any attention at all to this information, but again, no one complains about having to listen to it, you can only assume that these formulas have taken on a sort of liturgical function not unlike the repetition of the names Hang Seng and Dow Jones in more or less every Italian news bulletin, as if any of us in Italy cared what the Hang Seng had done this morning or might do tomorrow. And this constant, reliable, decorous repetition perhaps transmits to the harassed passenger the sensation that rather than simply heading home a little worse for wear and tear after another dull day at the workplace, he is in fact part of some grandiose, never-ending ceremony. And this is not such a crazy idea in the lofty temple that is Milano Centrale. Well, maybe because I spoke almost no Italian when I first came to Italy, there are certain words I actually learned from hearing railway station announcements. Words that remain forever associated in my mind with Le Ferrovie dello Stato. Ansiche, for example, and coincidenza. <laughs> Ansiche can occasionally be heard at the end of a pre recorded announcement. They will read out the whole spiel of your train description, its name, its number, its various services and stops. And right at the end, just when you thought all was well, you will hear Partirà dal binario nove. Ansiche dal binario 3, platform 9, instead of platform 3. <laughs> and the folks on platform 3 begin to trudge back to the concourse. I have a special affection, I don't know why, for Ansiche. There is something elegant and measured about it, like a person who keeps calm in a crisis. And I'm always glad to hear that word. I repeat it to myself under my breath, Ansiche. And when I hear it in other circumstances, I always think I am changing platforms. Coincidenza is often heard together with Ansike, but this time the voice will be alive and urgent, a real person talking into the microphone. Coincidenza is a curious word with a number of meanings. It can mean a coincidence in the, in the English sense of two things corresponding in some way or happening at the same time. Though it's not usually used in that English way. <coughs> Um, it can mean something happening uh, for pure, pure chance, but in Italian that would usually be un caso. When talking co about trains, coincidenza can be the word used to mean a connection. For example, in Milan, the train for Venezia waits for the train from Genova to arrive, well, maybe it does, so that people can make their coincidenze. And people love to complain about coincidenze bestiali, <laughs> nightmare connections. But the word is mostly used to announce a sudden and altogether unexpected development that requires an urgent response. Coincidenza, coincidenza. Suddenly a young woman's voice is speaking directly to us through the PA. She is husky and anxious. Coincidenza, interregionale per Verona, parte dal binario 6, anziché dal binario 4. Il treno in partenza. Il treno in partenza. Since it is not unheard of that they will announce the train as in partenza, about to depart, when in fact it's already moving, it's gone. <laughs> the coincidenza announcement can cause some panic and is often immediately followed by this warning. Passengers are reminded that it is forbidden to cross the lines. It is forbidden to cross the lines. And in fact, four or five young people have jumped down from the platforms onto the lines. Even more ominous, ominous 
The Nancy Ken coincidence is the dreaded word, soppresso. <laughs> On strike days, despite the fact that maybe 80% of the trains are not running, they nevertheless broadcast all the mechanical announcements absolutely as usual. The whole train timetable is sung out as on any other day, with the only difference being that at the end of each train description, the simple word soppresso is tagged on <laughs> in a rather louder voice than the rest. So you might hear, Interregionale 492 di prima e seconda classe delle ore 8 e 55 per Milano Centrale e soppresso. <laughs> Cancelled. And sometimes five or six trains will be conjured into existence, one after the other by this famous mechanical voice, only to be brutally dismissed. Soppresso. It is amusing watching the uninitiated tourists trying to get to grips with this. They will hear the train announced. Treno Intercity 813. Gabriele D'Annunzio. And they begin to congratulate themselves. Di prima e seconda classe. Surely no one would announce a train so confidently if it wasn't running. Delle ore 17 e 05. And they check their watches and it's on time. <laughs> per Bari Centrale. This is it, kids. We are going south. <laughs> e soppresso. <laughs> and once I saw a Japanese girl checking the word in those little, little electronic dictionaries of the Japanese, how they're so fantastic. I could see her lips mouthing the S and the P of soppresso. I could see her growing consternation. My dictionary gives sopprimere, put down, repress, suppress, abolish, liquidate, eliminate. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that whoever recorded the words did so with a certain pleasure. <laughs> well, thanks. That's enough of that. It's a little more cheerful than the rest. So should we keep this talk off the internet in case we are endangering your honorary citizenship? Oh, they know all about me. Well, thank you. That was wonderfully witty and, and, and just wonderful. So you spoke about a sense of belonging. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about to whom or to what you belonged when you lived in England. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a long while ago. Actually, actually, to talk about belonging and me belonging in Italy, um, I, I don't know how long we want to stay, but, but maybe right at the end to close, there, there's a, a, a tiny little reading I could give mm. about five minutes from here ab about that sense of my own belonging in Italy. Um, no, I grew up in a, in a very religious household, an Anglican. Uh, my father was an Anglican clergyman. Um, he became very involved in the charismatic movement, so that that was speaking in tongues and 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 um, healing people and exorcising people. Uh, so I belonged to a certain extent to that world, but but I didn't belong to it in the sense that, that I wanted to leave it at all costs. So it's quite. I mean, in in many ways, in many ways, my move to Italy, which which happened because while studying. In Boston, at, at, at Harvard, uh, I met the Italian woman who I, I then uh, very quickly married. Uh, and I went to live in Italy because she didn't want to live in England. Like she, she stayed in England for a while, and it did rain a lot that year. <laughs> and she wasn't happy with, with the, she wasn't happy with the weather. I mean, she wasn't happy with all kinds of things there. So we left and went to Italy. And for me, frankly. Uh, I wasn't one of those people who went to Italy out of a sense that, that it was a country of art um, and of beauty uh, that I already loved. I, I went there because she wanted, she wanted to leave, and it was fine by me because I was happy to leave too. Um, it, was, it was only after some years that I came to love, if one can use that word, Italy, and that I came to think about it very much as home. But, but that was probably about 10 years after I arrived there. So did you speak in tongues? Did I speak in tongues as a, as a, 
It's probably the, the only language that I did manage to speak in my teens. I, was always, I always failed French and German oral exams. Um, yeah, I, I kind of tried. I kind of tried, but it didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Um, there, there was, it was a very disturbing period of one's adolescence when you have, find you have a lot of pressure being put on you to do something as madly irrational mm. as, as, as uh, speaking some ecstatic language inspired by God. Mm. I've been trying to do it all my life, I suppose, in a way, but, but it, it, was very, it was very disturbing. Yeah. Can I always say that, yeah. Um, I just want to ask one more question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. To, to tune your ear before you write, who do you read? Oh, it's dangerous tuning your ear, reading other people, isn't it? Um, I think, I think if one wants to say something interesting about that whole question of, uh, like when you start writing, you're obviously imitating usually, and then through the process of imitation, you begin to understand that, you know, I used to love Henry Green, for example, and try to write like Henry Green, and then very quickly realized that. One of the reasons why I couldn't write like Henry Green was that I didn't see the world really as, as Henry Green sees it. Mm -hmm. So the process of imitation becomes a process of discovering your difference from the person you're trying to imitate. Um, when I went to Italy, I remember finding the writer Natalia Ginsburg, uh, who I still admire, admire enormously. Uh, and there you're being influenced, but well, the, the voice is much perhaps less distinctive than Henry Green. But when you're, in, when you're being influenced by a voice that's coming to you from another language and you then start, start thinking of that sound in English, there's less danger that you just fall into the pattern of using the same lexical fields. Mm. And this. You're actually, uh, perhaps the influence is a little deeper then. Uh, I don't go to any voices when I start writing now. Maybe in the past I did, but uh, it's not something I would do now. Are, are there any novelists you hate? Any contemporary oh, novelists man. you hate? <laughs> we could be here all evening. Uh, of course, there are all kinds of... I mean, you <laughs> Since we're not putting this on the internet, you can answer. Well, yeah. If you want, one of the things I, I, I did actually <laughs> translate uh, recently a selection from that Leopardi's famous Sibaldone, uh, Le Leopardi talks about how, how natural it is for us to dislike, envy, and possibly hate other people, and that this is almost basically a default setting. Mm -hmm. You can see that Leopardi had a rather negative view of life. But one of the things he says, that the people you're most likely to hate are those in the same profession <laughs> as yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is quite natural, because you obviously feel that you're in a state of competition with them. Um, and that they have no right to be there if you're there. <laughs> so, you know, there would be a long list of, of writers who, who, who I'm not entirely enthusiastic about, but I don't really feel it's a good idea to start naming. Okay, three more, uh, three more. All right, thank you. So are, are there questions the audience members would like to pose to Tim? And, and we have a microphone somewhere that we're gonna pass around. Thank you. Elizabeth, over. Thank you for your words. Um, the question is, um, do, you th do the Italians consider themselves part of the European family, and has that changed over the past 40 years? Oh, um, well, as, as we know, the Italians were among the most enthusiastic members of the European community at its, at its beginnings. Um, I think until about five or six years ago, uh, the European community was more positively seen by the Italians than, than any other, uh, than the peoples of any other nation. However, after the introduction of the Euro, um, or rather, after it began to be clear about five years ago that the Euro had not been the huge success that everybody uh, had wished it would be, and that in fact, European economic policies are a disaster for Italy. Uh, and to a certain extent responsible for the economic situation. 
people have generally lost faith. That doesn't mean they don't feel part of the European family. I think they very much do, but uh, there is no faith really in Italy now in the European community. Just a feeling that that it would be something of a disaster trying to leave. Uh, one of the things that happens with the, with the vision, the vision that Leopardi has, that basically everybody is is engaged in self-interest, and the only the only esteem that they seek from other people is from their immediate peer group and immediate family group, uh, and that otherwise they are locked into a state of constant battle with each other, it means that it is very difficult to get anything done in Italy. Uh, because it's almost impossible to get a consensus uh, to change a law or do anything. We, I mean, we're now witnessing with the present government in Italy a, a rather extraordinary business of a, of a prime minister who actually wants to get things done and is trying to do that, which I think is the first prime minister for a very long time to try to do anything. Uh, and uh, he's finding it extremely difficult. So w one of the r results of that was that when Italy got got more deeply involved in the European community with the Treaty of Maastricht in the 90s and then the Euro, the idea was that all, all the difficult decisions would be handed over to Europe so that the Italians wouldn't need to make them anymore <laughs> and that they could get on with the business of spending the money that, that, <coughs> that the Europe... I mean, I, I think there genuinely was that feeling that history had ended you know, we don't enter the euro and everything was now safe and could be looked after by somebody else, just as the church is looking after the destiny of my soul. We, um, mm. and, and, uh, and, and that we could get on and enjoy life. Uh, <laughs> of course, it hasn't quite worked out like that, and I think as a result, people, you know, for the first time, people are actually talking, well, maybe, maybe something has to be done to change European politics. But nobody really believes in the possibility of profound change, I don't think, in Italy at the moment. Yes. You have lived in Italy for several decades now. Uh, I don't need it. <laughs> no, you don't. He <laughs> doesn't need it. You have lived in Italy for several decades now. Uh, to what extent has it changed? And to, what, and to what extent is it exactly as it was when you were first there? Well, I mean, uh, you know, lots of things have changed. Um, but yeah, when, when, when I think when the foreigner arrives in Italy, he usually feels that he's witnessing the very last period when Italy will be a special and rather different place, and that very soon mm. it will become a boring state like the other states, uh, because they're constantly talking about reforming all the, all the things that, that make Italy special. Like, we're constantly being told that bureaucracy is now about to be simplified. Um, <laughs> And, and so on and so on and so forth. So, you know, I remember thinking when I arrived, well, very soon it will be like like France or Germany, but but actually no, no. <laughs> and one of the extraordinary things about the process of simpli simplification is how much more complicated it has made life. Um, so, so you know, genuinely, probably not that much has changed. And, and if you think you think of a process like Tangentopoli, where it was it suddenly became clear to everybody that the political parties, and in particular the Christian Democratic and Socialist Party, had been paying themselves vast amounts of money on more or less every contract uh, that, was, that was taking place. And we all thought, or <laughs> perhaps I thought, but generally a few of us thought that something might change, but, but actually nothing changed. And just, in, just recently we've had another extraordinary uh, collection of arrests around issues of, of, um, of corruption. Uh, rather catastrophically, in, in Sicily, uh, the, the, the pillar of a viaduct just gave way and a viaduct collapsed uh, on a quite a new road uh, and it turned out that the contractors had not been putting enough cement in the, they'd been putting in sand and it seemed that that a lot of people were aware of this and there have been arrests and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, there are days when it is extremely depressing. I mean, you know, if, if one began to talk about the university and the way jobs are handed out, you know, then I would perhaps have, have to ask for the, the uh, camera to be turned off. <laughs> but um, but it, it's, it is pretty depressing in that regard. Obviously, there are other things that make in Italy wonderful. 
the artist. Well, one thing that has changed in the last 30, 40 years is immigration. Uh, Absolutely, no, yes. Vast very. amounts of immigration. Absolutely, of Different right kinds of that. different waves. And how the Italians have dealt with it is an interesting and complicated question. No, absolutely question. extraordinary. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote, and uh -huh. that is um, I go to Venice a lot if I can. I try, uh -huh. try to go to Venice a lot. When I go, I stay in not so expensive hotels, middle level hotels. I'm unhappy for you about yes, that. Yes, yes, and uh, in, in real neighborhoods, as it were. And the last few visits to Venice, um, the owner, not just the person behind the desk, but the owner of the hotel uh, was either Ukrainian or Bulgarian, uh, I think, uh, and maybe Russian, uh, in three, ca three cases, Slavic peoples, who, oh. interestingly, were not commuting out of Venice in the evening to, to their houses on terra firma, uh -huh. but who had actually, were actually living in apartments in Venice uh -huh. full time and raising children there. That's a big change. Yeah, I mean, the, the immigration has been huge. When I arrived in Verona, um, there was maybe a Marocchino, a Moroccan, selling carpets occasionally. Now there's, there's quite a percentage of Verona is uh, made up of uh, African, uh, Chinese, Indian, uh, Slavic, Slavic nations. It is very interesting, actually, to see um, how they fit into the Italian, the, the Italian pattern of belonging. It, that is, be, because Italians themselves uh, tend to have a, an intense sense of belonging, it is by far the most important value is being honored in your group, which means that any other moral laws are irrelevant besides that, which is, which is why you will do anything for your group regardless of, of, of its correctness or not. So they actually accept very much that that immigrants form separate groups and pressure groups. They don't invite um, the same kind of um, integration that, say, the English would like to insist on, or the French in particular. Um, in the area I live in, in Milan, I would say 80% of the population is non-white. Um, all, the, all the bars are owned by, by Chinese except, except one. Um, the Chinese are now very good at making cappuccinos. There is a cappuccino <laughs> school in Milan which teaches foreigners and mainly Chinese people how to make a cappuccino uh, and how to enjoy a cappuccino because, of course, if you, if you don't drink cappuccino, you're not going to make a good cappuccino. So, you know, yeah, things have changed enormously there. And one has to say, you know, I've said a lot of bad things about Italians. But it's extraordinary how little violence there has been in this process. There is a huge amount of racism, which I would say is hardly surprising. But there is very little violence. And the Italians continue to accept daily the arrival of hundreds of people in, in the small villages and towns on, in the south without any help at all from the famous European community. So, um, so that has been a big change, yeah. That's been a big change. Yeah, I don't know. Let's let the lady go first. Um, I, I, was, I was curious about what you, what you said about um, having figures who are fully honored or full and fully dishonored. Uh, and maybe it's my own view of uh, life, uh, uh, certainly uh, my view of of American life, that th there, there's almost never anybody who is fully honored, you, you, you yeah, unanim yeah. unanimously honored, but there's certainly people who are fully dishonored. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, I, and I was just, I, I, I was thinking of a, of a different sphere of life, wh wh which you've written about, apparently, uh, which is athletics, uh, sports, uh -huh. uh, or I shouldn't say athletics, because that has a specific meaning in, in, uh, on the other side of the, the ocean. but but. Uh, but sports, um, and so uh, my sport is is cycling. I'm obsessed with, with uh -oh. cycling. So Lance Armstrong Judge. at this point is probably fully dishonored, uh, and there there are a few pocket of uh, pockets of holdouts uh, uh, with respect to, uh, and and I think of the most recent winner in the Tour de France is an Italian, Vincenzo Nibali. Uh, I don't know if you pay any attention to yeah, cycling. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I, I find that uh, you know American cycling fans 
love to meet Italians because they think they're going to find cycling fans, and no Italians that you meet outside of Italy are cycling fans. Oh, really? I, I don't, this, is, this is my, but the, but uh, I, 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 I bridled a little bit at, at, at what you were saying about fully honoring, <laughs> fully dishonoring uh, figures and the significance of that. And I, I, I wonder if you could just elaborate on that, maybe from the perspective of sports well, heroes and the like. Well, I think basically, to go back to what I said, the question of Schettino. Schettino was, was a highly respected figure in his little village of Pizza because he was a ship's captain on a very major ship. So if the rest of the country disguised, decides that Schettino has behaved absolutely disgracefully, taking his young lover on, on deck to show off how close he could pass to an island, and as a result, sinking one of the world's largest ships and losing 32 lives into the bargain, and then abandoning ship before anybody else did because he was anxious to save his skin. You would have thought that we have now arrived <laughs> at the, as it were, non plus ultra, bad behavior. And yet the town of Pizza actually put up banners to welcome him back. Um, it, it's an extraordinary fact. And, and one of the interesting things about, for example, the comment sections that you can read under articles on the internet is that it does give you a chance to see how perversely people are thinking. Um, and in Italy, generally, if somebody is being dishonored, um, you will see immediately that a piece, uh, somebody will write a comment entirely in support of this, of this person. Um, I, think, I think it was an interesting intuition, really, on Leopardi's part. Obviously, Leopardi's aware that he's putting forward an extremely caricatured vision of the country, but that caricature usually has some kind of basis in, in reality. So he, he's not imagining that he's speaking the gospel truth, is it? Is there such a thing as fully honored figures? Uh, certainly in, cer certainly in, in, in Italy, you can't be fully honored insofar as you belong to a local group. Other local groups will not honor you. So, for example, even when the national football team plays, you will hear fans saying, you know, how can I really like so-and-so who plays for Juventus, you know, w which I hate? They kind of can't get over the idea that when he plays for Italy, he, he's sort of somehow managed to drop his Juventus uh, identity. Uh, I, I, for, for me, it was quite a revelation when I read that line. It, it seemed to me suddenly to, m to make clear one of the things in Italy is how completely schizophrenic the country can be about certain figures. Berlusconi is one, but Andreotti was another one. Andreotti was accused of more or less everything. I mean, he was accused of, he was accused of being, being of having, having ordered murders. He was accused uh, of, of being in collusion with mafia bosses. Uh, he was accused of fixing endless things. Uh, he was deeply, deeply loved and admired by many people um, and, and deeply, deeply hated and loathed by other people. And there's never any question that Italians will ever come to any agreement on those issues. The Second War, for example, remains something that can't be taught in schools because nobody agrees, really, about who was in the right uh, over those issues. So the country's still very divided about that. Um, I just wondered if there are any prominent female politicians in Italy right now, and if so, uh, are they discussed differently in the press, and how are they regarded by the public? Oh, yeah, there are many prominent, uh, you know, Berlusconi brought in a lot of, a lot of young ladies <laughs> into politics. Um, and he's always kind of toying with the idea of making one of them the figurehead of the party. Um, Renzi, who is, who is the present prime minister, already also clearly sees an electoral advantage in bringing in a certain kind of, of woman in, into power. And he has ministers, but they're none of them in, in important ministries. 
There's an Italian woman who holds the foreign minister position for the European community. Uh, there are uh, older women politicians like Rosa Bindi um, on the left. It, it's extraordinary. Uh, you know, I, t I mentioned before insults. Um, you know, there, there are extraordinary, or extraordinary physical insults over over women in politics and power in Italy. So that either are accused of being the floozies of other politicians, or you know, Berlusconi would simply make the most horrendous remarks about the fact that you know that Rosa Bindi's was not an attractive woman. I mean, she was quite clearly not an attractive lady, but but I mean, and and and, and he's not in any way pretending to be so. But, but, you know, really direct and unpleasant, aggressive remarks, uh, sexist remarks. And, and, and all these things pretty much, pretty much get by, yeah. Um, but there's no sign of a, of a woman in Italy at the moment who would likely become prime minister or anything, anything like that. Uh, I think a lot of the whole belonging issue becomes that you attach yourself to a certain person, right? I mean, you know, in the university career, you attach yourself to a certain person, you become part of that person's entourage, and that is the way that your career develops. That there is no other way of developing a career in the Italian university. Uh, as a result of that, that figure is usually male. That figure is usually male. Uh, and, and as you go up the scale, uh, the social and political scale, that figure might own a football team or might, you know, uh, and lots of the football teams are owned by sort of Mr. Parma, well, it was, was Tansy before the company collapsed for fraudulent bankruptcy. And, and he owned Parma for many years, and Berlusconi owns Milan, and Moratti used to own uh, Inter Milan, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the figure of a woman who becomes, as they call it in Italy, a barone, um, is, is rather rarer. You, you have extraordinary conversations. I remember, I remember a particularly illuminating moment when I had recently arrived at the University of Milan and I was sitting next to the woman who brought me in there, who was head of faculty. And somebody taught, uh, somebody made a comment during the faculty meeting and she said to me, you know, Tim, I've never understood who protects Patrizia. And it was like this statement, like, I can't really understand who this, whose entourage this woman is, is in. And that would, that's a kind of standard conversation. Who is this person attached to? Who, uh, so it's not a really very exciting position if you want to make a situation, if you want to make a career in academe. Um, it's rather unhappy. That was a happy note to... Uh, <laughs> Would you like to read a little bit more for well, us? Well, I mean, if guys are up for it, I don't want to... This is really... This yes. is a sunny piece. <laughs> this is a five... A, a little five-minute piece. Uh, I don't want to go into the very complex details of how this book came into existence, but as I was finishing it, I decided to make a trip down south because I, I, I felt almost embarrassed that I didn't really know the south well enough. Um, and I just took a series of very small trains. Uh, at first I went down from Rome to Sicily by train, which is a sort of lunatic thing to do. Um, they actually put the train on the ferry. You don't get out of the train to get on the ferry. They put the train on the ferry. That actually takes about an hour, which is sort of crazy, because if you got off the train and got on the ferry, uh, it would be so much easier. I recently spoke to the heavy, as a result of this book, I was actually invited by the president of Italian Railways to address a national conference of all the managers of Italian Railways. <laughs> and he actually told me that they finally decided to end the process of putting the train in. <laughs> anyway, and then I went all around the coast of Calabria on these little trains. Um, they're us usually little two-carriage diesel trains. Um, it, it's an extraordinarily beautiful way to spend some time. There's almost nobody on the trains there. Completely subsidized. It costs you like two euros to get your ticket. You know, it's wonderful. Like a vast beached sea monster, the abandoned chemical plant north of Crotone 
disfigures the coastline, another failed attempt to do something with the South. Never mind, I told myself. Sit back, gaze through the smeared windows, enjoy it. Beyond the factory, beaches, bleached white river beds, mile after mile of olive groves, the Gulf of Taranto, empty sand with clear blue seas, kiwi plants, row after endless row, field after field, broken walls, stazione di Torre Melissa, vineyards, promontories with grey rock against blue sea, stazione di Ciro, the Capotreno's whistle, an ancient tower on a low hillside, squat square masonry, abandoned factories, cactuses, scorched grass. Stazione di Crucoli, graffiti, ti penso sempre, amore mio. Immigrants with cheap merchandise climbing on and off, getting stuck between swing doors. A stocky Slav on the seat behind me who is organizing them. Get off here, you get off there. Stazione di Cariati, Anna e Giulia Troie, scrubbers, that means. No sign of railway personnel anywhere. And then in English, boys, 1978, wanderers everywhere. At Sibiri, we switched trains for the section to Metaponto. That is, we exchanged one heavily scrawled, poorly air-conditioned single carriage diesel for another heavily scrawled, poorly air-conditioned single carriage diesel. The train revs and the fumes intensify. The air conditioning is just enough to stop you from losing your head, just. A whistle and a lurch. One is usually so worried on trains about time, or at least conscious of time. Will we depart on time? Are we running on time? Will we arrive on time? This regionale is traveling with a delay of 11 minutes. Trenitalia apologizes for this inconvenience. This interregionale veloce is now approaching Verona Porte Nova, terminus of our journey. On time! Thank you for traveling Trenitalia. Time, time, time. But today I have decided to pay no attention. I shall not think of time at all. I refuse. There is only one train running north and east along the Gulf of Taranto, rattling and swaying and stinking of diesel. It is our train. There are no branch lines. There are no choices between regionale, regionale veloce, intercity, Eurostar, Freccia Rossa. There is nowhere else to go but where we are going, along the timeless Mediterranean coasts. I have firmly decided I am not going to look at my watch the whole four-hour journey. <laughs> I am on holiday in a part of the country I have never visited. It is hard, though. It is hard not to look at your watch. It is hard to be here now on each stretch of the journey without being anxious for the end and without wanting anything to happen on the trip that you can engage with and write about. Buy your ticket each day now, I tell myself. Wait for the train, climb aboard. Do not expect company for the journey. Do not expect to understand why there is a delay. Don't ask whether the train is punctual. Don't worry what Taranto will be like or what Lecce will be like or what Brindisi or Bari will be like. Don't be concerned that you may have nothing to say about these places. Just be here on this journey at every moment of the journey when the train is hurrying on and the landscape is whisked away here and gone, here and gone. And when the train stops and the same dull station name imposes itself for 20 minutes, Trebizacce, Trebizacce, Trebizacce. Learn to be happy with Trebizacce. And happy when the inspector blows his whistle and electric warning sounds and the doors slide shut and Trebizacce slips behind at last. It's gone. I almost miss it. Now Roseto and now Monte Giordano. Accept the names that come and go, places that will never mean anything to you. Rocca Imperiale. Policoro, you are simply here on a journey from Crotone to Taranto, from this moment to the next, translated, transported by Le Ferrovie dello Stato. I think I am learning to take the journeys less anxiously, 
The sun helps in the general feeling. That's interesting. Train noise. The general feeling that these railways are not part of an urgent business world that can be, they can't be speeded up. They are what they are. I am learning to take them day by day and to accept that I really did move my life to Italy 30 years ago. I am not sure why, but this trip to the South has made me think about that decision again. 30 years ago, I surrendered my identity, my Britishness. I became this strange hybrid, neither here nor there, between places, between cultures, recognized everywhere as English, but not really English now. Accept that. Now you are on a journey through tiny stations whose names are all new to you, Scansano Ionico, but as real to those who live here as any other place. They are as much part of your adoptive country as Verona or as Milan. Look at the bamboo growing in the gully, look at the dry gorse, look at the ruins and the broken doors and the fat mother crouching on the platform to spray deodorant onto the armpits of her infant children. You are here now, arriving in the station of Metaponto, whether on time or not on time, simply doesn't matter. So for a few hours, my mind lapsed into this strange mood, lulled perhaps by the rhythm of wheels on rails, stifled by the poor ventilation, mesmerized by the fierce sunlight on this arid landscape. Thank you.